This episode is brought to you by Progressive. Are you driving your car or doing the laundry right now? Podcasts go best when they're bundled with another activity, like Progressive Home and Auto Policies. They're best when bundled too. Having these two policies together makes insurance easier and could help you save. Customers who save by switching their home and car insurance to Progressive save over $775 on average. Quote a home and car bundle today at Progressive.com. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National average 12-month savings of $779 by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2022 and May 2023. Potential savings will vary. Not available in all states. History as it happens, September 26, 2024. Nation building or nation wrecking. Somalia. Start off as a humanitarian mission, then changed into a nation building mission. And that's where the mission went wrong. And as a result, our nation paid a price. And so I don't think our troops ought to be used for what's called nation building. On my orders, the United States military has begun strikes against Al Qaeda terrorist training camps and military installations of the Taliban regime in Afghanistan. Our mission in Afghanistan was never supposed to have been nation building. It was never supposed to be creating a unified, centralized democracy. Nation building has a bad rap after the disastrous failures in Iraq and Afghanistan and the rise of America first politics at home. But nation builders contend the United States has more successes on its record than it gets credit for. And they say the U.S. must stay involved, helping failing or fragile states build institutions of a stable civil society. We'll debate next as we report history as it happens. A podcast from The Washington Times. I'm Martin DeCaro. So I look at nation building as the coherence of the state and the nation. So I look at the state as the place where governance, governing services are provided. Citizens ask, do I have running water? Do I have electricity? Do I have security? So it's all of the, the institutions that provide services to the people. The nation is one level above that. That's the sort of blood and belonging, as Michael Ignatieff puts it. Now, you can belong to a nation whether you like it or not. You know, you're part of the French nation, you're part of the Kurdish nation, you're part of the Mexican nation. You can be part of that whether you like it or not. The question is, does that nation provide a vision for you? On October 11, 2000, about a month before Election Day, Republican nominee George W. Bush debated Vice President Al Gore with Jim Lehrer moderating. And the topic was foreign policy, the U.S. role in the world after a decade without an obvious enemy. The Soviet Union was long gone. Russia appeared in decline. China was not a superpower. And the Clinton administration had been criticized for getting involved in too many places what Bush called nation building. I thought the best example of, of a way to handle a situation was East Timor when we provided logistical support to the Australians, support that, uh, that uh, only we can provide. I thought that was a good model. But we can't be all things to all people in the world, Jim. And I think that's where maybe the vice president and I begin to have some differences. I am, I am worried about overcommitting our military around the world. I want to be judicious in its use. You mentioned Haiti. I, did, I wouldn't have sent troops to Haiti. I didn't think it was a mission worthwhile. It was a nation-building mission. And uh, it was not very successful. It cost us billions, a couple of billions of dollars. And I'm not so sure democracy is any better off in Haiti than it was before. In his memoir published 11 years later, Bush said he changed his mind about nation-building after the al-Qaeda terrorist attacks on September 11, 2001. Al-Qaeda was based in the failed state of Afghanistan. The battle is now joined on many fronts. We will not waver. We will not tire. We will not falter. And we will not fail. Peace and freedom will prevail. Two decades and four presidents later, President Joe Biden put an end to the failed American project in Afghanistan because he said it was never supposed to last as long as it did. We never gave up the hunt for Osama bin Laden and we got him. That was a decade ago. Our mission in Afghanistan was never supposed to have been nation building. So here we are about to elect a new president, if we're talking about Kamala Harris, or in Donald Trump's case, re-elect a former president. And there's been almost no substantive discussion by the candidates about the U.S. role in the world at a time when Americans have soured on nation building. So what is nation building? Should our country be in that business? What is the cost of not intervening when a country is collapsing? 
Well, the United States is still involved in many countries, helping set up state institutions, police forces, judicial systems, what have you. Stuff that doesn't receive as much attention as war. Keith Mines was once in the 82nd Airborne, then had a career in the State Department. In all, 32 years of government service. He's worked in Colombia, Grenada, El Salvador, Somalia, Haiti, Sudan, Afghanistan, and Iraq. And he wrote a book about his work as a nation builder in Why Nation Building Matters, Political Consolidation, Building Security Forces, and Economic Development in Failed and Fragile States, which I read to prepare for our conversation here. He is now vice president of the Latin America program at the U.S. Institute of Peace here in Washington, an expert on post-conflict stabilization, peace building and negotiations, and the roots of civil conflict. Keith Mines, welcome back to The Washington Times. Thanks. Thanks for having me. So I have here the book you wrote, which is part memoir, part history, part career, professional experience, your travels as a professional soldier, diplomat, where nation building worked, where it did not. But what attracted you to this as a young man? You were a Mormon missionary, right? And you went overseas. Right. So, uh, and the book itself had an interesting provenance. I had a, a very clever title for it, Boots on the Ground, Wingtips in the Palace, uh, Why Nation Building Matters. And the the, uh, the editors wanted to get the title, uh, the, the nation building part right up front. It was kind of funny because it hit just before President Biden uh, famously said, we don't do nation building. So not much of an endorsement for the book. And then the editor insisted on putting all the the keynotes in the subtitle so that hopefully somebody would find it on Google if they were looking for something other than just nation building. Anyway, so that's how the book came about. And it was, you know, I had, I didn't have the, the, the fame to do a pure biography. Some, you know, famous policymakers can do just their biography. I didn't quite have that, but I also wanted to do something that was relevant based on my experience. So I took this theme that I had worked on for years, for decades, and tried to capture it in the experiences that I had had. But it did all start um, with my service as a missionary for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Mormons, in Colombia. And one of the experiences that I most remember was sitting in a um, cardboard hut, because it was in, outside Bogota, with this family. And there was probably an eight-year-old kid, and I asked him what he wanted to do when he grew up. And he said he wanted to be, I think it was an astronaut or something. Now, that was a cute aspiration for a kid sitting in a, a cardboard hut outside Bogota. But it occurred to me that he not only wasn't going to be an astronaut, he wasn't even going to be an engineer, just because of the structural governance of the country, that there just wasn't an educational system that would ever lift him up. There wasn't an infrastructure that would allow citizens to have the full benefit of the natural resources, the human resources of their country. And I think even in that very early phase, I was 19 at the time, I started to see governance as really the issue. I mean, if you want to be helpful in the, in the, the third world outside the United States, you can do a lot of things. You can go build clinics, you can dig wells, you can do a lot of projects. But I came to see that the governance was really the issue. And that was reinforced in my later travels as a military officer in the mid 80s as well, that it was really about governance. You were in the special forces, right? Right. So you were hardcore then. I was then. <laughs> <laughs> we just walked up a couple flights of stairs to get here. You did okay. We're both winded, though. <laughs> <laughs> and then you went to work for the U.S. Well, no, no, you were a diplomat. Mm -hmm. You were a peacemaker, an institution builder. Now you're at the U.S. Institute of Peace. Mm -hmm. How should we define nation building? We're going to be talking about this. We should have a definition of this term. Right. So I look at nation building as the coherence of the state and the nation. So I look at the state as the place where governance, governing services are provided. Citizens ask, do I have running water? Do I have electricity? Do I have security? So it's all of the, the institutions that provide services to the people. The nation is one level above that. That's the sort of blood and belonging, as Michael Ignatia puts it. Now, you can belong to a nation whether you like it or not. You know, you're part of the French nation, you're part of the Kurdish nation, you're part of the, the Mexican nation. You can be part of that whether you like it or not. The question is, does that nation provide a vision for you? Does it provide something that you really kick in for, a Periclean notion that I'm, I'm Athenian and, I, and that means something to me because I know this nation is here for me. And that's the part that I think often gets a little off track. And you, you've seen cases where... The Kurds, for example, had, they yeah, had... A nation without a state. Right, a nation without a state. And then you've had states without nations. When the Balkans broke up, 
all of those guys were states within a now dysfunctional nation that had to then be morphed into this multitude of nations. And it's landed actually reasonably well for all the pain that they had to go through to get there. So Selma and Heather Gregg put it this way, building or rebuilding a state requires more than developing the capacity of its government or security forces. State building programs also need to foster and strengthen the population's sense of common destiny and the need for its various factions to work together to build a healthy, prosperous state. In other words, a state needs a population that coheres and supports the government and other state building institutions for it to flourish. This is national unity building. And that's the part that we've gotten right, I think, more than we give ourselves credit for. But when the two go together, you have a viable nation state. Clearly throughout this complex world of ours, there are some groupings of people who do not want to be part of right. a single state. A place like Afghanistan, Afghanistan is not a country. Today, it has groupings of people who maybe don't belong in one state as we see it. One of my critiques of nation building Maybe I'll get to the point here instead of meandering like I usually do, Keith. One of my critiques of nation building, it's an artificial construct on people who maybe this isn't the right thing for them. Well, I mean, it can be. And, and certainly, you know, you look at the, the world of, of the post-World War II world was about 50 countries and there's 172 today. So somebody has been doing nation building. A lot of that was in Africa, of course, with the post-colonial period. And there was a whole, there's a whole story that I think gets far too little attention about how the UN primarily guided that process where these newly decolonizing nations would become the world of today. And, and again, it's kind of better than most people give it credit for. But no, there was a lot of bloodshed, though. But sure. you know, you're right. I mean, sure. there were people who wanted to break away from what was an artificial construct of Correct. colonial, British, French, what have you. Right, right. So there was a lot, there was a lot of sorting out to do. But I mean, going back to the, the question, the issue of how a nation comes to define itself comes to cohere. It's an interesting example, I think, with Iraq. If you look at the early days of Iraq, there were many, to include our current president, that thought that Iraq ought to be three countries, that it should just divide up into Kurds, Sunni, and Shia. The Iraqis, frankly, even the Kurds, really didn't want that because they knew that it was going to be a horrifically difficult thing to manage. It was going to leave the oil, the Sunnis without oil. It, was, it had a lot of complications. They really didn't want that. And what they've come to is a sort of federation, federalism, that works in a very low-functioning democracy with high levels of corruption. But it, it does tend to, to work in a way that I think some of the other ideas would not have. The well, Balkans, it's a question of who is imposing what on whom, correct. right? So correct. you're right, the idea of splitting Iraq up into a federation of three different states, that was a reflection of not understanding the strength of Iraqi nationalism, correct. which people thought was... Not real because Correct. the Iraqi nation had just been created on a map mm -hmm. uh, in the post-World War I order when the British and French were carving up the Middle East behind everyone's backs, right. right? And Iraqi nationalism did develop over the decades. Right. You know, it would have been different if the Iraqis themselves had designed it back in 1920. It wasn't an option. wasn't the way it, it evolved. So it was something that they had to kind of work through. What I would say is that I listened to the, the Iraqi prime minister around the 2016 period, and I asked him a question, you know, was there any better way to have done this? And there's certain, he said there certainly were better ways to have guided the process. But he also thought that it was something they had to work their way through. And basically what it came down to was the Sunnis, the Shia, could not treat the Sunnis the way the Sunnis had treated the Shia when they were in charge. And they thought they could initially. After all that bloodshed... But they landed at a place where the three confessional groups now kind of understand we have to be a nation. We have to figure this out. Exhausted by two decades of killing each other. Right. And, and you know, there's no guarantee that this is going to hold. And Afghanistan was also, I think, one where I actually dismiss the, the idea that it isn't a nation. It can't be a nation. It has actually been a nation for quite a while. I mean, the Soviet invasion of 1979 destroyed everything. I mean, that's kind of the yeah. starting point. When I, when I think of Afghanistan's history as not being a country, by the way, I get that sentence from Artyom Borovich, late Soviet journalist who was among the first journalists to go in with the army mm -hmm. in 79. He was with the last Soviet troops to leave a decade later. Mm -hmm. I forgot the name of his book. I'll hopefully remember the title during our conversation. But the first sentence of the book by Borovich is, Afghanistan is not a country. Yeah, I don't agree. I wasn't there for 10 years and I didn't yeah. leave uh, over the, the bridge into Uzbekistan when it was all over. But I do think that's a little short-sighted. There's nothing else that it can be but a country. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't really have other options. People say, well, it's just a bunch of tribes. They don't work together as a nation. There were definitely things to be worked through and design issues about the Afghan 
political structure. After the, the liberation of Afghanistan in December of 2001, in the Bonn Conference and elsewhere, those issues were addressed seriously. There was a question about whether it should be a federation. The Afghans didn't really like that. The idea was that making it a federation was constitutionally difficult, not something the foreigners ought to be involved in anyway. So it was, it was basically the minimal, the minimal toggling to what Afghanistan had already developed, which was a constitution, and then the loya jirga as the way Afghans come together to make decisions. So those two kind of key events were what yielded the first government by mid-2002. And then from there, it was a long process of trying to help that government to work, which we didn't do very well. But It never had legitimacy outside. I mean, that's why uh, Karzai was called the mayor of Kabul, not <clears throat> the president of the country, the mayor of Kabul. Well, let's return to Afghanistan. Yeah. I want to talk some of these broad, big issues, big ideas about nation building. So you began as a missionary, altruistic, religiously inspired. You wanted to help people who were in need across the globe. Mm -hmm. But then you become an employee of the most sophisticated and lethal killing machine in human history, the U.S. military. Why does the United States know what is best for others? Because, well, you know, when you're an individual, you're doing this for your church, for yourself, but now you're part of this government. You know, nation building by the United States is rarely altruistic. We're doing it for political ideological, mm -hmm. any number of, of reasons, right? So why does the U.S. know what's best for others? Well, we obviously don't always. We have pushed through political settlements that were ill-conceived. We're usually uh, guilty, I think, as much as anything, of just not staying with something as long as is needed. The U.S. model is usually to get a country to an election and then leave it alone, and we're very focused on elections as the key thing that a country needs. Obviously, it needs a lot more than that. We need to stay with it for a long time. There's times also when we would impart a very complex system that a country was just not capable of, of sustaining. That was usually in logistics and other security-related things. And then there's sometimes when we just have a very clumsy imposition on a country that's not ready for the changes that are going to take place. Although I would argue that in many cases, it was going to come with or without us. I think that's one thing to think about. You know, I, I admit it's damned if you do, damned if you don't. Uh, if you, you go in at all, it's wrong. If you stay too long, it's wrong. If you don't stay long enough, right. it's wrong. So I get that. But in what form are we talking about here when you say the U.S. sometimes needed to stay longer than it, than it did? Militarily, having a large military footprint? Because in my view, the longer the military or really any major U.S. presence stays, there's then no incentive for the people of that country to create their own institutions. Right. Well, two of the cases that I like, and these are actually the the first one, Colombia, where I, I served as a Mormon missionary and then I dealt with again later. Um, and this is a success story in your view. Qualified success. They're all qualified, but it's, it is a success story. Yeah, as you look at the trajectory of when we came in later with Plan Colombia. What year? Plan Colombia was under Clinton, so 96 okay. or so. Uh, and Colombia was a, was a narco state, was a disaster. It was really slipping into ungoverned territory. The narco insurgent cabal, the FARC, controlled a lot of the territory. The ELN was blowing up the pipelines. I don't think the central government ever would have, would have fallen, but it was certainly in a place where they had lost territory. They were really kind of struggling as a country. The United States was worried about narcotics flows. The Colombians wanted their country back. And we had this joint thing called Plan Colombia, where we put in really heavy le levels of, of assistance. I think it was Israel, Egypt, Pakistan, then, then Colombia in terms of U.S. foreign assistance. So it was a mix of security assistance and assistance for uh, AID type projects and a host of other things on the citizen security and, and economic side of the equation. And it was really a very consistently de delivered program. Now, there was no boots on the ground. We had a lot of contractors. We had a lot of military officers and bases and things like that, but there was no hint of any U.S. fighting force. And that allowed the Colombian government to retain the nationalist card. This is one of the things that I think we often robbed from the host country. And this goes back to the writings and the thoughts of Rufus Phillips that was channeling the work of Lansdale from all the way from the 1950s with the Philippines. The Lansdale thesis was that one of the key things we need to start with is supporting the nationalist card of the government we're trying to help. And in his case, it was Magsese in the Philippines. The United States can't come in and override that. We did that in Vietnam with catastrophic results. And Rufus Phillips, who had worked for Lansdale, he was the last living link that I'm aware of of this. He died a couple of years ago. But he just, he did a book called Why Vietnam Matters, where he tells that story that it wasn't about more firepower. It wasn't about bombing the North Vietnamese more. It was about helping the South Vietnamese to have a cohesive government that was supported by the people. 
and could generate the kind of energy that somehow the North was doing with the Viet Cong. So anyway, that was, that was kind of his, his lesson yeah, on it. that didn't work out well. But, it, but we didn't do it. His point is we didn't do that. So if we had done that, who knows how it would have worked out. I mean, well, but South Vietnam was an invention. It was a, a construction. So was North Vietnam. That's true because of the line that was drawn uh, yeah. after the French nightmare ended right. in 1954. There were supposed to be national elections, right. and the U.S. was pivotal in preventing those elections from happening because we knew that Ho Chi Minh, Correct. being the most popular politician in the country, probably would have won. Correct. So we weren't for nation building in that case because a communist would have won the election. Right. But we did just enough to do it poorly. But his point was, if we had supported the nationalist, and we lost it early on. I mean, the North Vietnamese basically came in as the nationalists that are going to reunite you as Vietnamese. The United States inherited the colonial legacy of the French. Yes. There might have been no way to avoid this, but... Well, because Phillips, the United States soldiers don't belong in Vietnam. Vietnamese belong in Vietnam. And we were always going to be seen as invaders, occupiers. Right. Unless we had done it with a much lighter footprint. So what Phillips would argue is that when we came in with the big battalions and we, we, we just took over the war, that was a big mistake, yeah. that if we had done it through the Vietnamese the whole time, again, who knows, still might not have worked, but, but it certainly wasn't going to work the way we did it. Yeah, I wasn't expecting to talk Vietnam here. No, but sorry it, about that. Vietnam always, you know, it's still relevant. <laughs> it's the shadow, no, and it's got, it's got a lot to do with this, actually. Well, I mean, that was a failed nation-building project because, again, South Vietnam was not a, a real thing. You can say neither was the North, but... The Vietnamese were hell bent on liberating their country and from unification, right? Yeah, for, and, and unification, that, right. Right? and that was what they—that's the card they played. Right. And but it doesn't it, mean the peasants in the South wanted to be living in a Marxist-Stalinist. Right. It was a wretched right. government after after we got out of right. there, and the North Vietnamese won. We did not understand how hard the North was willing to fight, yeah. and I think any normal person, any, any normal country, would not have fought that hard. So it was—that's a big part of you know, your nation building formula for success. I mean, having some understanding of the people right. that were helping, especially if they want us there, right? I mean, there have been cases where mm -hmm. a U.S. presence was welcomed by, I mean, that's been right. your experience, right? Well, so let's go to, let's go to Colombia, you know, back okay. to finish Yeah, we kind of so, got uh, sidetracked no, 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 from it, Colombia. But it's but good, go but ahead. it's relevant. But I yeah. mean, Colombia, you did have a people that wanted our assistance. U.S. assistance was very popular there, and we remain popular today. It's a, a very unique country in just having, having a good image and association of the United States and a certain amount of graciousness, I think, for what we were able to do. But again, we did it without taking it over. We didn't have boots on the ground. We didn't go in to fight. We didn't fly helicopter missions. Um, we actually flew a lot of relief missions and, and logistics and stuff like that, but we weren't in the fight. And that, I think, really gave the Colombians the ability to mobilize their own people, their own, their own solutions and things. So that was a good example. It played out to where we got, finally, this was always the goal, to get to a peace process with the FARC. Um, they finally signed a peace accord in 2016. Juan Manuel Santos won the Nobel Prize for his work on that, and they came in from the cold, and there was a whole demobilization process. And that turned out to be just one conflict among many. So there's still a lot of fighting going on, a lot of displacements going on in Colombia. There's a, it's an unfinished peace process, but that was one key part of it. The other one that I point to is El Salvador, where we also did not put boots on the ground. There was a temptation to at one point. The Congress, thankfully, said no to that. They allowed 55 advisors on the ground and then whatever other advising we could do uh, in other places in the United States. So that was what I got involved in in 1983, I was just out of college, and I, was, I had gone to a very conservative university, Brigham Young University in Utah, and even there, I mean, there was a lot of questions about what, what we were doing in our Salvador policy. It looked yes. to us like we were supporting this brutal, you know, military dictatorship. Well, that's what the United States was doing. But by 1983, it was actually not a military dictatorship at all. It was a democratically elected government, one that we had hold some cards to channel in a moderate direction. Well, there was a shift a bit in the Reagan policy, right, towards promotion of democracy, because at first, the first few years, it was supplying the junta with with what it needed to crack skulls and, and try to defeat a Marxist insurgency. I wanted to get to El Salvador in a bit, but we can talk about it now. There was a shift, right, in trying to make El Salvador a democracy, to phase out military rule and bring on civilian rule. Right, yeah, it, it was, I mean, it was quite a dramatic shift, actually, and it, it happened... By the time I got there, it was, it was fully in play. Um, you had a government that was, and we had steered them away from a right-leaning government. There was the election of 80, maybe, where Dalbusan was the one that would have won that, right-leaning, brutal guy, association with death squads. We steered them away from that into the direction of, of Duarte. 
And Duarte was a very moderate, very popular uh, leader that could steer, again, the country through this thicket of right and left into the center. And that was what I, what I came to accept by the time I did a, a short mission, four months training the new cadre of, of Salvadoran junior officers. So I had 40 of these guys that I was the, the mentor for, the leader of at Fort Benning as we were trying to, to form this whole new army in El Salvador that would stay out of politics, adhere to human rights, but still be effective on the battlefield. And I think we did that rather well. It's funny, I was just with one of them last week, 41 years later, and we had a, a good meetup. And it's funny that he was the one I ran into when I was in El Salvador, because I remember at the end of the training, he was the most skeptical of what we were doing. And he said to me in a very sober moment, he said, Mi teniente, I'm just not sure what we're doing. I'm from the middle class. I'm going to go back and be fighting against other kids in the middle class that got pulled into the other side. He was very skeptical about it, but he stayed with the project. He actually stayed in the military and retired 20 years later as a military officer. And he did it because when he got back, he realized, you know, we cannot let the country fall to this very small number of insurgents, 9,000 or so, but that were really potent and really had effective fighting skills. And there was times when it looked like the government might fall to them the way it had in Nicaragua. He did not believe that was the right course to go, and I tend to agree. I think steering them to the center really was the right policy. And why? They, well, Getting back to the question, why does the U.S. know what's best for others? Because this was a Cold War policy. Well, it was a Cold War policy, so we had our interests whether or not they were aligned with the, the aspirations of that country. But I would argue in this case they definitely did. The country was never aligned with the extreme left. As a country. I mean, they were able to fight their way into villages, brutalize people, shoot mayors, all the things that they do to take power. They were able to do that by force of arms. But the polling was overwhelmingly in favor of a democratic government, again, slightly right leaning, but satisfied with somebody in the center. Getting through, again, another really difficult peace process 10 years later, they eventually got to the point where they had that centrist. Um, vibe. They had the centrist thing going, and both parties from there were able to toggle back and forth. You had Arena winning one year, you had the FMLN running the next year, the FMLN reinvented itself as a political party. I can't think of a better outcome than that. Now, and they were there, the Marxist hard left insurgency. Right. And they basically reinvented themselves as a social democratic party. And okay. that's what they've been ever since. I want to return to El Salvador and uh, the legacy of Reagan-era foreign policy more broadly in a little bit, because that is the context here. I'm saying, why does the U.S. know what's best for others? Why do these nation-building projects matter to you? Why should we care as Americans? You know, right now I'm thinking of the so-called Clinton doctrine that he stated near the end of his presidency. He's talking about, you know, why should we care Mm -hmm. when this seemingly insignificant small country that is no security threat to the United States is falling to pieces. Why should we intervene in that matter? It's easy, for example, to say that we really have no interest in who lives in this or that valley in Bosnia, or who owns a strip of brush land in the Horn of Africa, or some piece of parched earth by the Jordan River. But the true measure of our interests lies not in how small or distant these places are, or in whether we have trouble pronouncing their names. The question we must ask is, what are the consequences to our security of letting conflicts fester and spread? We cannot, indeed we should not, do everything or be everywhere. But where our values and our interests are at stake and where we can make a difference, we must be prepared to do so. Can't be applied in every situation. And we know the United States doesn't intervene everywhere. There are plenty of failed or failing states or troubled places. But in this context, the Reagan administration decided to intervene after criticizing the Carter administration of paying too much attention to human rights, failing to intervene when there were left-wing insurgencies in places like Nicaragua, Mm -hmm. right, where the Sandinistas did topple the government. So we're going to start where you begin in your book, 1983, Mm -hmm. Grenada. This is also about kicking the so-called Vietnam syndrome. As far as I see it, there were three reasons the Reagan administration gave to invading this tiny, harmless country that most Americans couldn't find on even a map of the Caribbean. It is a small place. Three principal reasons. Uh, The kidnapping of the medical students, that their lives are in jeopardy. Mm -hmm. Second, uh, a Soviet-Cuban military bastion would have been established 
for the export of communism throughout the region. And number three, the military airport. And you make reference to this in, in your book. I don't think there's any real evidence that the Soviets were going to build. Reagan held up a photo of something. But even if they were, I mean, so what? Let there be no misunderstanding. This collective action has been forced on us by events that have no precedent in the Eastern Caribbean and no place in any civilized society. American lives are at stake. We've been following the situation as closely as possible. Between 800 and 1,000 Americans, including many medical students and senior citizens, make up the largest single group of foreign residents in Grenada. The medical students, spread of communism in our backyard, and the airstrip. Based on a prediction of what would happen had we not intervened, and no one can know the future for sure. But the idea is if we don't intervene in this place, all these bad things are going to happen. And it is against American vital national interest to allow uh, a left wing government in this tiny little place, Grenada. What is your counter to that? So, as you know, I refer to it as a liberation, not an invasion. Yes. Um, and what was an invasion? But go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so I, there's a fourth one that you could add to that, and that would be restoring the will of the Grenadian people. And that gets lost in this. But if, if you look at the incipient events that led to us intervening, Grenada had fallen into a communist government led by Maurice Bishop. Bishop was, frankly, probably a moderate who got pulled into this thing. It's a little bit like that scene in the second Star Wars movie where, uh, what's his name, Caldacian or whatever is walking out. And he says, this deal keeps getting worse all the time. I know what you mean. Um, That's right. It was a deal that he had made where he thought he could have autonomy from the, from the United States, from the North, and then he kind of realized he was getting pulled into another orbit. As I understood it, and as the history seems to indicate, he was having real second thoughts about this and was ready to strike a deal to pull back from the Soviets and maybe get either realigned with the United States or at least not to have the, the heavy hand of the Russians and the Cubans in his country. In the course of doing that, he was then assassinated by two of his own people. So two hardliners, Austin and Cord, uh, assassinated him in the interest of going much more hardline. The people of Grenada, I think, had no love for Soviet communism and for Cuban presence. Well, everybody we talked to in the month that I was there hated the Cubans. They were arrogant. They were unhelpful. They were not. Uh, they and there were, were Cubans not. there. You're right. So. There were Cubans there. I mean, it was now the airstrip. I mean, the airstrip was big enough to take a, a Soviet backfire bomber. Was that why it was being built or was it being built to do more, more tourism, which is what they professed? to take larger planes for tourism. That's a very odd contention since their tourism industry had been all but destroyed. And then the threat of communism is one that, I mean, from my experience living through that period was, was very legitimate. That was it a question of dominoes. We kind of learned that lesson in Vietnam. It really wasn't, but. You know, this is called threat inflation. Maybe. Yeah, I mean, so it could be all those things. Now, it's noteworthy that Margaret Thatcher was incensed about the whole thing, you remember. She was really upset with Reagan over this. They had a very heated conversation. She said, do not in invade or liberate this place. She was very upset about it. So her, the British view was really an over overkill uh, yeah. for something that could have been handled in, in another way or just allowed to play out. So, I'm, you know, there is that too. You were there as special forces. Mm -hmm. yeah. As in the 82nd Airborne Division. Yeah. Your experience interacting with Grenadians was, well, they weren't picking up guns to shoot at you, except for, well, except for the the insurgents or the, the communists who had toppled Bishop. There, there really weren't any once we got there. Yeah. So you were welcomed, in other words. Yeah, we were welcomed as liberators. I didn't, I'd never seen anything like it uh, since World War II, where people would line the streets and, you know, we would walk down the sidewalk of the street and they came out to cheer. Every time we'd stop to bivouac, they'd bring us food. I mean, it's a very, uh, you know, unofficial survey, but I think it was pretty clear they were... It's important, though, because in yeah. other places, people pick up guns and start Correct. shooting at us. Correct. There was not, never any of that. I mean, I, th I think they were quite happy to, to kind of get their country back. I think they were very happy to see the Cubans and the Russians leave. Uh, they did need... They'd rely on tourism. I mean, they've got some spices, and then they got a ton of tourism. So they were really happy to get that back. The medical students, I don't know that they were ever, they weren't quite kidnapped. They weren't really under threat until we actually came there. So their threat actually was temporarily heightened when we got there, but very quickly reduced once they had all been found and sent back to the United States. They were quite happy to have us there because when Bishop was assassinated, it was a chaotic period. They didn't know what yeah. was going to happen next. You make the point in your book to say every country, of course, is different. So you mm -hmm. can't just take what worked right. in one country, nation building, and, and do it 
somewhere else. I mean, does Grenada fall under the nation building rubric? And what are the lessons for us? Because that's where the danger comes in. Well, this worked here and people love Americans and they want to be liberated. So we're going to push democracy over here. Right. I don't think it's ever been used as a model for anything because it's just so small. It's only 100,000 people in and out. The military was in and out. We were out, I think, in four months. But if you look at it realistically, we did leave behind a force to a Caribbean force that would train their police We left behind a lot of democracy building stuff. So, I mean, they were able after that to get to a place of medium functioning democracy that you never really heard from again because it hasn't had coups or problems. It's a very consistently governed place. Very left-leaning now, by the way, which is fine. And the other countries around. Right. Were very helpful, right? It had a neighborhood to land in. That's something that was really helpful. It just needed to get back to its CARICOM CARICOM, roots. CARICOM, man. They actually... wanted the U.S. to intervene, didn't they? Correct. They They were the ones that asked for it, but but under exactly this model, please do a quick intervention, turn it over to us, and we'll do the rest. And they did. So, you know, you never heard about the follow-on, but there was follow-on. And and I think the point is, though, anytime there is an intervention, there's got to be a follow-on, some of which are hugely complicated. And I think we treated them almost like a Grenada. We'll just turn this over to somebody else, and hopefully they'll have an election. And Good luck with the future. And, and that's where the question of how long we stay in what configuration with what other tools is, is the looming question. And that, that we have really gotten wrong. Last weekend, I was awakened in the early morning hours and told that six members of the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States, joined by Jamaica and Barbados, had sent an urgent request that we join them in a military operation to restore order and democracy to, Gren- to Grenada. They were proposing this action under the terms of a treaty, a mutual assistance pact that existed among them. These small, peaceful nations needed our help. Three of them don't have armies at all, and the others have very limited forces. The legitimacy of their request, plus my own concern for our citizens, dictated my decision. I believe our government has a responsibility to go to the aid of its citizens if their right to life and liberty is threatened. The nightmare of our hostages in Iran must never be repeated. I have to say, I am torn about some of this because I just don't want to have the attitude, well, to hell with it. If Grenada goes to hell, what do we care? A tiny, harmless country. But, you know, there are also unintended consequences of intervening in the affairs of Mm -hmm. other nations. So Mm -hmm. we're going to return to El Salvador now. I have here an essay by Andrea Onata Madrazo for the Texas National Security Review. The title of this essay was The Most Important Place in the World. I think that's tongue in cheek, but it's in the context of the Reagan Doctrine. This is what Andrea Onare Madrazo writes. Although Reagan promoted democracy as a panacea for the country's ills and bolstered moderates within the Salvadoran political right, U.S. military assistance to the Salvadoran armed forces exacerbated the conflict in El Salvador and weakened civilian governments led by the very moderates the United States was attempting to prop up. In providing unprecedented amounts of aid to the Salvadoran army, the Reagan administration bears responsibility for the grave human rights violations committed by Salvadoran state forces during Reagan's two terms in office. Furthermore, the Reagan administration obstructed efforts to negotiate a peaceful resolution to the Salvadoran Civil War, helping to perpetuate a conflict that, between 1981 and 92, left over 75,000 civilians dead and 20% of the country's population of 5 million displaced. And this is a a current issue because Mm -hmm. what was going on in El Salvador and other places caused immigration to Mm -hmm. the United States. That has had a political backlash when these people were eventually deported if they committed a crime in our country. We deported gang leaders, criminals back to these countries, further destabilizing them. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, how do you untangle all of this? Because you're talking about El Salvador as a success story of nation building. So her timeline, I I don't quite follow. I mean, the massive human rights violations were pre-U.S. involvement on a large scale with retraining and retooling the Salvadoran military. But for the first two years of Reagan's term, 81, 82, we were giving money and assistance to the... We were. To the we were, but we were, so yeah. here, I and they were committing mass murder in some cases. Oh, yeah. Massacres on a large scale. That was where the big massacres, uh, Sumpal and Mozote, those were all in that period. At least one of them was by a U.S. trained battalion. What we had done is we had brought whole battalions to Fort Bragg 
they trained them as battalions, but they trained them in, you know, like a four-week course on how to do, quote-unquote, counterinsurgency. The mistake, and we caught it early on, was that the leadership had not been retooled. And when I say retooled, that sounds like re-educated, but whatever. I mean, the, the, the leadership of the Salvadoran military was in this old model that was really, really nasty. And again, that was I had hesitation about working on the whole thing. Not that anyone gave me a choice, but I wasn't sure I wanted to do, be involved in that. You know, in, in 1983, when I was called up. But 83 was when we caught ourselves, and uh, I think it was General Gorman. It was the Southcom commander said, look, what's needed is a whole revamping of the Salvadoran military. It had been this very small cabal of officers whose job was to reinforce elite rule, kill communists, you know, not even in the field, but in the cities. Or anyone suspected. Anyone of, suspected. You know, students, of students protesting. Correct, yeah. correct. It was horrible. I mean, it was really a bad model. So the military side of the new model was let's train an entirely new cadre of officers, retool the entire Salvadoran armed forces, and they brought up two large classes of, of officers, a total of about four to 500 to Fort Benning, where we had, uh, we had a training program that would then disperse them into the, the Salvadoran military as this newly trained U.S. norms and values adhering force that would change all of that. Now, it, it wasn't a perfect record because there were still some human rights violations. And right up until the peace process, it was like a year before that, you had the killing of the priests and the nuns in San Salvador itself by mil a military unit. So it wasn't, it wasn't perfect, but it was better. The big violations of human rights, the massacres ended. And you can just see the line of, of human rights violations. It goes down and it has a marked decrease with the U.S. trained officers. You said when you were called up to take part in this project in 1983, I mean, did you question why the U.S. is getting involved in a national civil war in a tiny country? A little bit. I was, I was sympathetic to the notion that the communist model was going to be worse. And so this was the best of two bad outcomes. But I came to, to believe that this was actually a much better outcome and that it had, it had the the legs to be a good outcome. Did the U.S. intervention prolong the conflict, leading to more death and misery? Well, only if you believe that the other alternative of the FMLN taking over the country was better. I believe that would have been much worse. And I believe the human rights violations that would have come from an FLM victory would have been in the hundreds of thousands. I, I don't think they would have sat still, threatened by what was still a you know, right-leaning country, and so they would have had to carry out a Nicaragua-style program, purges, and all the rest. So I, don't, I, I think given the alternatives, it was the best possible outcome. For listeners who may not be familiar with FMLN, Farabundo Marti, National Liberation Front. Marti right. was a former revolutionary. Right. Uh, he was one from the 30s or something. Yeah. Yes. They launched a, a revolution because of the history of inequality, land, right? I mean, there was a lot, lot of right. layers there that we're, we're entering into. Right. Right. There was a whole, no, there was a whole socioeconomic context to this that was really hard. El Salvador was the hardest of any of the Central American countries, in part because of land. It just has the most dense population of anyone. There was a very good quote that was picked up by Walter Lefebvre. He used it for the title of his book in the 1970s or 80s, uh, Inevitable Revolutions. But he picked it up actually from a U.S. policymaker in the 50s who said, you know, with or without communism, there's going to be revolutions here. These were societies that were Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras that were really kind of left behind by economic development, uh, Guatemala less so, but El Salvador certainly, and just had a lot of catching up to do. But the land issue was always very, very front and center because there just wasn't enough land and was never going to be enough land to go around. So they had to get to some kind of an economic model that had industrial production and had you know, different ways of people making a living. Than, uh, than just everybody getting enough yeah. land for their growing family. Well, for the record, I don't want to live under a left-wing revolutionary government either. You know, this is a counterfactual, but did you ever consider, you know, what if we didn't get involved in this, didn't support a right-wing military junta or junta that was committing massive human rights mm -hmm. violations? If we don't get involved in this, it goes into the communist camp, right? A left-wing camp. All right, we can't live with that? That's such a threat well, to our security? Yeah, the, the other counterfactual you could use, though, is Guatemala, where we did not get involved. They got tired of us harping on human rights under Carter, and so they basically cut off any military assistance, and we did not intervene there. 
Uh, they went through then a lot worse human rights issues than El Salvador did, frankly, from the, the mid-80s forward. They had no guardrails on anything, and they really came in with some horrific governments. I think that probably would have been the way Salvador would have gone. I okay. think they would have gone in the direction of having these right-leaning governments with nobody to stop them. I don't think, I actually don't think the FMLN would have won. I think the right would have figured out a way to stave them off, but then would have been brutal in their response in a way that they weren't with our assistance. Here's a book I'm holding in my hand, The uh -huh. Violent American Century by John W. Dower. He's a wonderful historian and a very sharp critic of U.S. interventionism. Dower writes, there is little or no evidence that in taking sides in these wars and training and materially aiding anti-communist participants in them, the United States gave serious attention to human rights or the rule of law. I'm sure you disagree with that. I read your book. I know you mm -hmm. disagree with that. Right. In most countries south of the border, Washington supported right-wing regimes in their state terror. In Nicaragua, it abetted the Contras in pursuing a murderous campaign of guerrilla terror against the government. Proxy war, surrogate terror, disdain for human rights, and even for plain decency all come together. It is not possible, says Dower, to quantify the costs of this violence with any exactitude. For South and Central American societies, the political, cultural, and psychological costs were, and to some degree still are, enormous. Writing in the Cambridge History of the Cold War, John Coatsworth observed that the Contra insurrection in Nicaragua devastated the economy, forced the government to abandon most of its social programs, and cost the lives of 30,000 Nicaraguans, mostly civilian supporters of the Sandinista Revolution. Coatsworth also notes in passing that President Reagan visited Guatemala City in December of 1982 and praised the ruling military junta for its commitment to defend the country against the threat of communism. I know that President Rios Montt is a man of great personal integrity and commitment. His country is confronting a brutal challenge from guerrillas armed and supported by others outside Guatemala. I have assured the president that the United States is committed to support his efforts to restore democracy and to address the root causes of this violent insurgency. I know he wants to improve the quality of life for all Guatemalans and to promote social justice. In 1982-83 alone, the government forced 800,000 peasants into civil patrols ordered to uncover and kill insurgents to see their communities destroyed. It followed up on its threat by destroying an estimated 686 villages and hamlets and killing between 50,000 and 75,000 people. All told, sorry, I'm reading a lot here. Yeah, yeah. All told, Coatsworth estimates that the Cold War in Central America saw nearly 300,000 deaths in a population of 30 million plus a million refugees who fled the area mostly for the United States. Now, I want our listeners to know I do not mean to imply that you support the ugly parts of these policies. Mm. What you're saying is there's another side to the story that sans U.S. intervention, it would have been worse, or that we had a compelling national interest to intervene, even knowing there would be some unintended consequences. Is that your argument? I want to get it right. Yeah, kind of. I mean, they're all very different cases. That's so true. Ni Nicaragua and the Contras, I mean, I was, you know, I remember looking at the Contras kind of rolling my eyes. It was a pretty brutal way. Um, they were not very con well controlled. There was huge human rights violations on their part. Didn't Reagan compare them to the founding fathers? Or well, was that the Afghan Mujahideen? Well, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, no, they even used some of our founding documents to help them create their own documents. I mean, <laughs> it was a little bit of a muddled case. For whatever it's worth, I mean, it did lead to a return to democracy because it was that pressure that led the Sandinistas to have to come to the table, and that led to the, the election of Chamorro. So, um, you know, it was something that was a bit mixed. I don't write that off altogether, okay. but it, it was a pretty crude way of arriving at what we thought was a return to democracy. That You have to play some of this out now into the current day because Nicaragua then going toggling back and forth between different governments has now fallen into the very dictatorship that we were trying to get it out of in the first place, which is Ortega which if you look at Nicaragua today is a pretty brutal dictatorship that is itself expelling uh, anyone involved with human rights or dignity or anything else. They just expelled them from the country, a huge outflow of people. So we kind of came back full circle to where we started. And it's unfortunate that those civilian governments, those interim governments did not do better than they did. Same thing in El Salvador, by the way. So you ended up with peace process and then the toggling back and forth between right and left 
neither of whom govern very effectively. I had the good fortune of returning to El Salvador in 1994 as a political officer with the embassy. So I was able to see almost exactly 10 years on what had, had come about with the follow-on to the peace process of 89 and, and the ability to see the country in its, in its new form. And it was you know, a little bit sobering because you could see a security force that was underfunded, the justice system wasn't totally functional, you did kind of wonder, is this going to work out in the end? And in the end, they ended up with these very high levels of gang violence that have, yes. has now led to another uh, sort of authoritarian type government in a response to the problems that were not totally solved by the uh, the, the democratic toggling of, of these two different kinds of governments. Maybe there are no good outcomes possible in some of these situations. I'm glad you brought up what's going on today because we are talking about events that happened 40 years ago. We've been talking about the 1980s. There's been... <laughs> <laughs> decades yeah. of uh, history since. But this part of the world, it's often called the, the Northern Triangle, are still troubled areas, mm-hmm. and it does have implications for its reordered U.S. politics mm-hmm. with immigration to this country. I don't have to explain that. We all know what's going on in, in the country now about keeping all these people out is one of the, the rallying cries of one of our political parties. I know USIP is not a not a partisan outfit. Right. You got to stay out of all that. But no, it still does matter. But maybe there there were no good outcomes. We tried our best. It didn't work. We didn't try our best. Though. I mean, there. Yeah. you know, I have an article in the in the making called What If It Always Was About Nation Building After All? If you look at the unintended consequences, one way is certainly, as you have alluded to, the unintended consequences of our interventions. But there's also kind of unintended consequences of how we haven't had nation building at the forefront of many decisions. So thinking about El Salvador, for example, we had a gang problem in LA and without even a blink of of thinking about it, we started exporting all of those gang members, expelling them back to El Salvador. This was in the 2000s. Now that was an unintended consequence that led to essentially a gang takeover of much of El Salvador. Takeover not in the sense of what Haiti has done where they actually control all the territory, but being able to extort, kill, and control whole cities. Yeah. And, and that was that was an unintended consequence, a very poor decision on our part. There was a lot of other ways we could have handled that other than just expelling them all back to El Salvador, washing our hands of them, as though it was something that they had created. We had created that in the mean streets of L.A. They didn't have anything to do with it. Jonathan Blitzer has written a great book about all of this. Mm-hmm. I recommend that you and everyone listening uh, – Give it a give it a shot. Uh, Jonathan Blitzer, title of the book, Everyone Who Is Gone Is Here. Right, yeah. right, right. But go yeah. ahead. But we didn't have that framing. We didn't care about them. We cared about us. And I think if we looked at it and said, okay, what are the what's the consequence that's going to flow from this? You know, really, really a bad thing. We kind of did the same thing in Libya, where over a, a, what was a, at the time a very minor and singular human rights concern, we collapsed an entire government in the EU. The EU was actually ahead of us on this, which was very odd when you think about it. We collapsed the government, no idea for what came afterwards, no notion of how to then recreate the Libyan nation into a functional nation state. And the result has been this conduit for you know, millions of migrants coming up through Africa mm-hmm. and, and hundreds of thousands killed in Libya itself. So we, you know, the unintended consequences often of just not having a proper framing, I think, is something that we should um, we should be careful about. Now, the Reagan program, back to Quickly to El Salvador, I mean, there was a full program there for democracy and for economic development. You had the Kissinger Commission of the Caribbean Basin that that looked at tariffs, looked at how can we uh, more effectively use our assistance, high levels of civilian assistance and economic assistance. So we really, I think, did try to to bolster those fragile new governments. The place where I think we fell down the most was actually in the security forces. We gave them a very soft security force pulled the military completely out of security, which was a good thing in terms of no military involvement in politics, which it it has not been involved in at all since the 1989 peace accords, and neither has there been any political violence. This is something people often miss. It's a very violent place, so you assume it's all sorts of violence. It's actually not any kind of political violence. We got that completely right, but then on the democratic civilian side of security, we gave them very soft police, no carabinieri, no mobility, no heavy, heavy units or heavy weapons. And the gangs just fell into the, the void that, that was left by that soft security force. Yeah. Well, I'm glad I read your book as, as a critic who just sits in a comfortable studio talking into a microphone. I, uh, I was able to appreciate how difficult some of these projects are in areas that don't have to do with ideological, anti-communist, military, or supporting a military intervention 
for instance, Haiti. I learned about prison systems, the judiciary, you know, all the things that a nation building project is supposed to undertake and try to succeed. I got an appreciation for how difficult all this was. And in the case of Haiti, I would agree the United States does have an interest in seeing Haiti be stable for the sake of the people living there. Poverty, corruption, misery, famine. But of course, we also have the immigration issue. We're seeing that now, of course, with Haitian immigrants who have to flee their country for a better life. I I do tip my hat for your efforts there. But man, that was difficult. And that's a historical issue, too. The Haiti's centuries of poverty. Right. I, I would say that in all of these cases, the security forces are the easiest, even though we do it poorly. We could do it better. And and you could see where it could just be done better. The judicial systems are at the fulcrum of so much of this. They're at the, at the center of getting so much of this right. And it is the by far the hardest one to work on. You've got to go to law school to become a judge. Yeah, I mean, how do you, correct. Okay. You don't just pick somebody up and make them a police officer. So you need the, the human capital. You need the political structure and support behind it. And that was what I found in Mexico, too, because I worked in Mexico for four years as the, the director of the Merit Initiative, a big program to help Mexico develop, which they wanted to do. It wasn't us imposing it on them, a new system for justice and security. And and we fell exactly into their priorities. It wasn't us imposing on them, but it was us offering to help. But it's really a hard one because that's where the elite interests come in. I don't want a justice system that's going to, you know, stop me from working my little side deals. It really gets hard. And in all of these cases, Afghanistan was even worse, Iraq even harder. You know, there's just, that's a real hard one to work in. Well, you say in the book, it takes generations, plural, to establish something like this, a judicial system where there are no judges and uh, a penal system where you just have a couple of prisons where people are, you said something in there about how in Haiti, pre-trial detention. So you're arrested, you're charged with some crime, and you're stuck in jail for a year waiting for a trial. That's, that's and then the justice. best they could often do was was somebody would come in and say, okay, you, you have been in jail for as long as your sentence would have been had you had a sentence will now release you. That was a very creative way to deal with it. But you know, and then a, the, a, the earthquake hit in uh, the prisons, yeah. of course, crumbled and people got out and there was a crime wave of yeah. that. So you said part of the problem is that we're not actually doing the nation building. Nation right. building has a very bad reputation now because of Afghanistan. But you're saying that we actually don't take it seriously enough. So after the Soviets left Afghanistan in 1989, President George H.W. Bush is speaking to reporters saying we're not going to abandon the country. The international community has been steadfast in its support of the Afghan cause, and this certainly has been true for the United States. Uh, Our commitment, the commitment of the United States to the people there, will remain, and will remain firm, uh, both through our bilateral humanitarian aid program and through United Nations efforts to remove the mines and uh, resettle the refugees and reconstruct the help reconstruct the war-torn economy. But we know the United States did not stay. The government, central government, such as it was in Kabul, collapsed in 1992. A civil (laughs) war took place between 1992 and 1996, and these religious dudes named the Taliban take over the country in 1996. Osama bin Laden gets expelled under American pressure. Mm From Sudan, unintended consequences, he goes, well, he just goes to eastern Afghanistan because that's a place you can go without permission. There's no government there. And we know what happens next. Mm -hmm. So the idea then, after 9-11, was that we can't allow Afghanistan to fall to pieces again the way we did post-1989. But as I said before, Afghanistan, trying to turn Afghanistan into a country, that could only produce disaster. That could only end in failure. But I'm guessing you have a... A different take on I that. I do. So I was there twice. I was there in 2002 for the Loya Jirga, among other things. But I was Which there. is a council, basically. Yeah, the Loya Jirga is the, called the Grand Council. We have the advantage there over Iraq in the sense that the Afghans know how they do a national dialogue. The Iraqis kind of had to create it, and it, it wasn't very elegantly done. But the Afghans, historically, that's how they make decisions. Every village knew who was supposed to show up. Uh, the UN took on the task logistically of gathering the people. So they would they would fly a helicopter into a small village. They'd show up. They would sit down and drink tea with the elders. They'd say, well, now there's going to be a lawyer, Jirga. Who are your representatives? And, and they would invariably know who they ought to be just based on tradition and tribe and everything else. So it was relatively easy to put that together. The Afghans visually loved a lawyer, Jirga. They loved to see it. Part of the time that I spent covering it was out in the, the tea shops and the restaurants of Kabul, and people were glued to the TV, glued to the radio. They really wanted to see this work. Anyway, so they, 
there was going to be something like 1,400 delegates, and it kept growing. It eventually went to 1,700. The facility itself, there was no building big enough to hold all these delegates. So the Germans actually brought in a, an Oktoberfest tent, which I thought was kind of interesting in a, a, you know, a country that, that yeah, prohibits yeah. alcohol. Anyway, so they bring in a, a <laughs> ginormous tent. It was very respectfully managed. Brahimi was the SRSG, the special representative of the UN Secretary General. So the UN supported it. The ISAF, the International Security Force, provided some security, but it was a, the first Afghan battalion was the ones that actually protected the site. It was a very Afghan event. Brahimi told his people, I don't want to see you anywhere visibly in the tent. Everybody had to be really out uh, on the peripheries, still active and involved when needed, but a very active Afghan event. So that was following up on the Bonn Conference, which established a very temporary government. This was going to be the larger, the, the longer term government. So anyway, that was my first experience. You could see that there was a will by the Afghan people to return to being a nation. There's no other alternative to Afghanistan but being a single hopefully one day well-governed nation. There's no dividing line. I asked one of the guys in the North but is, I'm sorry to interrupt, but is it possible that a place is so broken from so many decades of war and displacement, something like that is, is so difficult to achieve? Well, it just means you have further to go. And that was what I argued in the end of the book, at the end of that chapter, was I said, this is, again, going to take generations. Not one generation, not a half a generation, certainly not two or three years, certainly not two or three months, which is kind of what we have initially yeah. bargained for. We came in and we lost really the golden hour because we did not want to do any of this stuff. And there were the, the nation builders like Jim Dobbins, my mentor for a long time, Ryan Crocker, that argued we have got to help them come back together as a nation. And then the Wolfowitzes, the Cheneys, and the others that said to hell with them. All we want is a platform for counterterrorism. We can do that with or without a nation. We just want to go get the bad guys. Well, that went on for a few years. We eventually came around to the fact that, yes, we need to help with national consolidation. Yes, sir, the consolidation. invasion in 01 was not about nation building. It was no, it was getting about rid getting of bin Laden, which we didn't do anyway. So, yeah. But once we had knocked off the government, there was nothing else to do but that. It's astounding to me that in a place so critical to American historical memory of having hosted the 9-11 attackers and then that sits astride Iran, Pakistan, China, Central Asia, that we would just give it up. That, that to me, is just absolutely astounding. The United States lost the war. <clears throat> could not we defeat didn't lose the, the war. We could not defeat the Taliban. We didn't need to defeat the Taliban, and we didn't lose the war. We were, we were in a very good place. All we had to do was I'm stay, talking about stay to it. 2021. By that 2021, point— 2021, we hadn't lost the war. But we, we couldn't defeat the Taliban. We didn't need to defeat the Taliban. The Taliban was an insurgent yeah. force. There's insurgent forces all over the world that are still fighting against legitimate governments. The government wasn't great, but it was as good as it gets. And it was something we could have continued to support at for very how long? low cost, for as long as it takes. Well, very low cost, an average of $300 million a day. Uh, not at that time. We were basically in support of the Afghan National Security Forces. Um, Which fell away the moment they saw an opportunity once we were leaving. I mean, that's... They didn't see an opportunity. They fell away because yeah. we withdrew our support, yeah. which they knew and we knew they needed to survive. That but, was their air power. That was their mobility. That was everything. But... As long as the U.S. is there, what incentive does the domestic force have in supporting? I mean, this is the same thing with South Vietnam. I mean, the U.S. was illegitimate presence in the country, in my view. I'll give you an example why. Uh, I just don't want to you know, be rhetorical yeah, here no. or hyperbolic. All right? I have a book by Cathal Nolan, a military mm. historian. He's been on my podcast several times. The title of the book is Mercy, Humanity, and War. Mm. Our allies in Afghanistan were also wretched. He writes, bad tactics were not alleviated by a pervasive problem with local allies, massive financial corruption. So Nolan chastises American military tactics in Afghanistan and also massive financial corruption. He also makes note about how drones floating in the air to, you know, airstrikes against terrorists would often hit civilians, right. terrorize the <clears throat> local right. population, children not wanting to go to schools because they're afraid of the drones in the air. But he goes on to say, politically and ethically worse, corroding claims to higher moral legitimacy than the Taliban was open sexual corruption of local mullahs, Afghan National Army generals, and Afghan National Police officers and generals. These are all the people propped up by the U.S. presence and 
U.S. taxpayers. Cruel sexual exploitation included routine rape of boys from poor families by armed Afghan allies. In valleys ostensibly anti-Taliban and loyal to the coalition, boys were dressed in makeup and girls' clothing and made to dance and sing for tribal elders who then raped them. Uh, the point is, this could only end in failure. I know you disagree with me, but that's just my perspective on this. Well, I mean, I don't know what period he's talking about. Again, it was going to be a very... But it all, but it all matters. I mean, it's all part of the American presence well, no, in the it matters, country. It matters immensely because it matters to raise the question of whether things were getting better under U.S. tutelage, if you will. I worked, my second job was 12 to 13. I was the, the senior civilian rep- representative for northern Afghanistan. I worked across all nine provinces of the north. So that was about a third of Afghanistan. And I had people that could work without any security at all. It was a, a very peaceful place. It was progressing economically. It, it's a hard economy to get anything going in because uh, there's a million reasons why you can't export. And it's just a really hard place to build progress. But that progress is real. I did a fact sheet because I got tired of hearing all the complaints from the governors about what we hadn't done. And I gave them a fact sheet of what we had done. I'm happy to share it with you. Sure. But it showed the progress from 2002 to 2012. Maternal mortality rates way down. Infant mortality rates way down. Food security way up. The wheat crop way up. For showing in the Olympics, and they actually won an Olympic medal. Cell phones way up, school way up for both man, boys and girls. Everything had gotten better, but it was still a long ways to go. It was going to take another 10, 20 years to do that. But if the United States can get that after an initial intervention, can get that to a place where it's sustainable, I would argue that it's, it's okay. Uh, we were not losing any casualties. The Afghan National Army was losing a lot. Yes, they so were the not, ones. It's yeah. not like they weren't fighting. They were. And the Taliban was never going to be the Viet Cong. These were not fanatical tunnel builders that were going to go to the last, you know, fight to the last man. There's a very, very fluid kind of of military situation in Afghanistan that I also referenced in a kind of a funny story about Dostum, one of the warlords talking to his Taliban counterpart during one of the attacks. It's a very fluid kind of an environment that I think if we had been, had had more patience, better sense of humor, we could have managed in a way that would have allowed them a way forward that did not mean going back to a Taliban regime, which now comes, of course, with its own unintended consequences. Yeah, yeah, Afghanistan is... All uh, the stuff that's going on now. Has so. deteriorated and... Back to famine and oh, back to yeah. <clears throat> all, the, all the daily... I'm aware of that, but after 20 years, now you're saying that the United States could have basically had a permanent presence in the country... It was the Afghan army and police that were doing the ground fighting backed up by U.S. air support. Right. And that was the key to holding off a Taliban victory, right. the fact that we had the air support. Right. Because you're right, the Afghan police and army, they were losing tens of yeah. thousands of casualties. Yeah. But the fact remains the Taliban had not been defeated. And you're saying that we could have lived with that. U.S. could have lived with that. I mean, think of Korea. Well, well, we've been, we've been in Korea forever. But there hasn't been fighting over the... Uh, but the, it's been, you know, it's been a big cost. It's been a lot of people... Again, we don't take casualties in Korea. We wouldn't have taken casualties in Afghanistan. But for how much longer and to what end? I mean, President Biden, who I thought made the right decision, although poorly executed, said we don't need to be in Afghanistan permanently to fight international jihadism. Maybe you're not looking at it just in that narrow sense. You're looking at Afghans deserve to have a functioning country. Well, but I'm also looking at U.S. reputation. Uh, and I think U.S. Ah, reputation getting chased out of a country. I, yeah. I think that's actually worth fighting for. I the credibility argument. Yeah. I mean, I mean, to have taken on this, you know, a country that, that we were attacked from, to turn it back over to the people that facilitated that attack. I don't get that at all. I hear you. It's you know, crazy. there's another way of looking at the credibility argument. I'll go back to Vietnam, too, because one of the main reasons for staying there as long as we did was that, and you can find these speeches by American right. presidents, Johnson and Nixon. If we abandon our ally in South Vietnam, what will our other allies all over the world think about American credibility? There's another way of looking at that. People start to question your sanity when you've been in a place for as long as you have and you're yeah. still not succeeding. And your presence there is violent, destructive and unpopular. What do you mean credibility? What about your sanity? And of course, there were many of our allies at the time who were telling the United States, get out of Vietnam. Don't worry about your credibility. Yeah. Worry I mean, about your image, your yeah. prestige. Vietnam did not attack the heartland of the United States. That is true. 
Um, but, you know, and, a terrorist think, attack can be planned anywhere now. Yeah, but I think there was also an inevitability factor in Vietnam that there simply wasn't in Afghanistan. I mean, you could see in Vietnam, we are not going to, at any cost, be able to hold off an inevitable North Vietnamese invasion. So I think we, we kind of knew that. Yeah, these comparisons are limited, I'll yeah. grant you that. So I, I would just, I would say this one was different. And then geographically, it's also very different. Was the government of Ashraf Ghani a legitimate government? You know, those later elections were pretty funky. It, it was a, an odd arrangement with him and Dostum. Dostum I knew pretty well. Rashid Dostum. Right. From right. The, I knew that from my time in the North. He I destroyed a Kabul back in the 1990s, didn't Correct. he? Was he was shelling. one of the warlords that was shelling yes. Kabul. He yes. destroyed the place. Yeah. I mean, there's a, there's a subchapter in my book called Towards a Post-Warlord Society. One of the things that I watched with Dostum and, and the meetings I had with him, he'd always have a bunch of young people around him, but you realize these guys are pure window de- dressing. They never got to say a single word. And I asked them afterwards, I said, you guys have anything to say? You know, and they're like, well, we got to wait till the boss <laughs> lets us. And it was a very warlord driven society based on fighting the Soviets and then coming out of that. And, and the that, civil war from 92 to 96. Yeah. yeah. And so that, you know, but they were also the ones that teamed with us to get the Taliban. So you couldn't just totally dismiss him. It was a very complicated thing. Again, a lot of that was going to take a while, longer than I wish it had, to sort out. But they were moving in the, in the direction of a stronger civil society. You had civil society groups that were forming up. Youth were incredible. I mean, they, you'd go to the universities and they just... They just unleashed. I mean, they had, they were so hopeful of the future. They had things they wanted to do. They had plans. So you could see this wave of youth across the country that was ready to be involved. It had this big blockage of the warlords and the corrupt politicians and the Taliban standing in their way. I think they will still one day get to that. It's now going to take a lot longer than it would have had we stayed the course. I'm a bit surprised there isn't violent resistance to the Taliban regime. Yet, anyway. People are just tired. Yeah. They're so tired, and they don't want to fight anymore. That's, and I don't blame them. Which is why I think it was right for the United States to get out. But we can, we can agree to disagree <laughs> on that. So U.S. Institute of Peace does a lot of stuff. Uh, we're talking here kind of one-on-one. You're not necessarily speaking for USIP in defending you know, Reagan-era foreign right, policy, right. right? I just want to make that clear. But USIP does a lot of state building. Mm-hmm. Right? We talk about nation building, but state building, institutions, doing a lot of peacemaking, trying to get mm-hmm. warring sides in a lot of different countries to put down their guns and create a civil society. Right. Where around the world today would you tell us there are some positive nation building efforts underway where the United States is involved. So we do a couple of things that I would point to in, in Colombia is probably our most is our most active team in the hemisphere. We have a, a team that's working on all of these residual conflicts, the ELN, the Gaitanistas, the, uh, the former FARC dissidents. There's a whole lot of people still fighting in Colombia and they work on things like ceasefires, how to strengthen ceasefires, stronger inclusion of civil society into these ceasefire mechanisms. And then across a lot of the Institute, we do a lot with simply dialogue. We have a very strong national dialogue team that helps when a country is going to go through a national dialogue. We have a a very good study of the principles that will give you a successful national dialogue, which is often a way to peace. And then local dialogues. We have something called justice and security dialogues. And these are training uh, civil society, business community, journalists, educators, to participate in a dialogue with their security forces. And it's a really critical element in having good democratic citizen security. What happened in El Salvador was tragic because they kind of just overrode anything the civilian, the citizens might have contributed and went right to a very draconian state of exception. But there's a way what, to What year this. was that you're talking about? <clears throat> the state of exception was two years ago. Okay, because we've been talking El Salvador yeah, since 1980. Okay, go ahead. And it was basically just jumping over the citizens to get to a very draconian uh, mass arrest and mass incarceration, which is where they are today. But there's a place where citizens can be helpful there. But we do these, uh, we help manage these dialogues all over the, we- the world. We've done some in the Sahel. There was the, actually the Kenyans that are deploying to Haiti were, so we facilitated a dialogue that they did in the communities of northern Kenya. Sorry, when you were here the first time, we were talking about Haiti being on yeah. the brink of collapse. That situation has gotten a bit better it's since. It's gotten better. It's tentatively better, and there's a footing from which to, to work now. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I just listened to our interview. I wanted to see where I left off, so I listened to it on the way over, and I was reminded that was at a time when 
they hadn't even formed up this new government yet. So. Yeah, there was no government when yeah, we Yeah, there is a government now. There is a security force. The Kenyans are there. Haltingly better, but still a very long ways to go and not entirely clear there's enough behind it. And one pitch for the UN is I think everyone now is looking to try to go back to a UN framework for the simple reason that on much of this nation building stuff, the UN, as Jim Dobbins has pointed out in his many books, is really the, the best entity to bring it about. They can stay longer. They bring better leaders they have a financial infrastructure that doesn't rely on just U.S. funding. Today, intervention is synonymous with military intervention. Right. There is soft power. Right. There are ways to help countries with our technological, scientific, right. our wealth, our know-how, right? Mm-hmm. And this goes back to Harry Truman, not the Truman Doctrine containment speech of 47, but his inaugural address in 49. On a recent podcast, I said 48. The election was in 48. His inaugural address in 49, Truman, it's implicit in his words. He understands that in the developing world, socialism would be attractive to people coming out from the yoke of colonialism, imperialism. And he talks about the importance of the United States donating, giving its technological and scientific know-how to help these people have agriculture, have whatever. We must embark on a bold new program for making the benefits of our scientific advances and industrial progress available for the improvement and growth of underdeveloped areas. We can wrap up with this question. What should be the motivating factor here? You're a believer in nation building doesn't have to be ideological, right? I mean, there is, I mean, we talk about autocracy a lot today, democracy versus autocracy. But what should be the driving force behind nation building to produce better outcomes? Mm-hmm. Well, I think the migration argument is actually a good one. And that is not just migration from different countries up to the United States, although that's probably enough. But the migratory trends in the world are really disturbing. First, it was 60 million migrants on the move. Then it was 70. Then it was 80. Then it was 90. I think it's over 100 million now. It's going nowhere but up. That's a global figure. Correct. That's a global figure. But we are a, a globe on the move. And yeah. with climate change and, you know, high, more disasters. I guess this is involuntary migration. Yeah, uh, it's going to get worse. So I think focusing on what goes on at home is really still the low cost way of dealing with what is now this, this just general churn of people throughout the world. And it is hitting everybody. It's hit Europe, obviously. It's very destabilizing. And on a humanitarian note, I think the American people, you know, we try to be real politic adherents and what is, you know, what's our real interest. I think the, the American people in, in their heart have a humanitarian bent to how they see the world and how they do things. We don't want to take casualties for humanitarian situations, but we ought to be at least focused on how to build stronger, more internally cohesive nation states that function well. It was kind of the whole idea behind the root causes strategy that the Biden administration talked about in Central America. But there's ways I think we can do all of this better. And the fragility, the Global Fragility Act was another effort by Congress to address this. And I think it's really important to look at these these things. And then just finally, the, the question of ungoverned spaces, I think, opens up the door to a lot of things, some of which we can't even see, anything from terrorism to uh, massive corruption to, again, the, just the drop in, in living standards in places that we care about. There are many sincere and patriotic Americans who harbor doubts about sustaining the commitment that three presidents and a half a million of our young men have made. Doubt and debate are enlarged because the problems of Vietnam are quite complex. They are a mixture of political turmoil, of poverty, of religious and factional strife, of ancient servitude, and modern longing for freedom. Vietnam is all of these things. Vietnam is also the scene of a powerful aggression that is spurred by an appetite for conquest. It is the arena where communist expansionism is most aggressively at work in the world today, where it is crossing international frontiers in violation of international agreements, where it is killing and kidnapping, where it is ruthlessly attempting to bend free people to its will. And into this mixture of subversion and war, of terror and hope, 
America has entered with its material power and with its moral commitment. Why? Why should three presidents and the elected representatives of our people have chosen to defend this Asian nation more than 10,000 miles from American shores? On the next episode of History As It Happens, as war escalates in the Middle East, we'll look back at Sabra, Shatila, and the Abyss. That is next as we report History As It Happens, a podcast from The Washington Times. Ryan Reynolds here from Mint Mobile. With the price of just about everything going up during inflation, we thought we'd bring our prices down. So to help us, we brought in a reverse auctioneer, which is apparently a thing. Mint Mobile Unlimited Premium Wireless. Ready to get 30, 30, ready to get 30, ready to get 20, 20, 20, ready to get 20, 20, ready to get 15, 15, 15, 15, just 15 bucks a month. So give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. $45 upfront payment equivalent to $15 per month. New customers on first three month plan only. Taxes and fees extra. Speed slower above 40 gigabytes in detail.